Hey everyone, it's Lynette Schaefer, and you are joining me for Lighting Controls Basics course number three. Now I'm going to be going over sensors in this particular training. Now from a high level perspective, there are standalone sensors and there are network sensors. Standalone sensors in many cases provide independent operation of the entire circuit. However, they can also be installed on fixtures individually. The issue with this is that you can probably imagine you kind of get this popcorn effect since each fixture will turn on and off as it senses motion, which can be slightly annoying and not to mention it can be very expensive as well. Network sensors, on the other hand, provide operation of single or multiple fi fixtures based on a group or zones of fixtures. And really the circuitry and the wiring really doesn't matter with a wireless type of network sensor. So when it comes to sensors, there are photo sensors, there are occupancy sensors, and there are also sensors that kind of combine both photo and occupancy sensor as one um, specific unit. So let's start with photo sensors first. Photo sensors, generally speaking, detect daylight. They can also be known as maybe like more like a dust to dawn or a photo cell. Um, these typically, um, the way they work is that, you know, if there's daylight out, then the fixture won't turn on. If there is no daylight uh, or limited daylight, then they'll turn the fixtures um, on. And that's basically the whole principle behind a photo sensor. Now, daylight harvesting is a form of a photo sensor uh, or photo cell. Uh, it's slightly different in the fact that with daylight harvesting, which is used in a lot of commercial type applications where you have natural sunlight coming through the space, with daylight harvesting, that sensor is programmed to look for a specified light level, and it's up to the owner to or the installer to state whatever that level needs to be. But basically, that daylight harvesting sensor maintains that specified light level throughout the day. So in this example, in the lower left-hand corner, as the sun comes up, you're going to notice that the lights will dim down, and then as the sun sets, the lights will come back up to full intensity. Now, it could very well be that there may be enough natural light in the space, whether it's from daylight coming in the windows or just other artificial light in the space, that those lights might actually turn off entirely. And if that's the case, that's even more energy savings. Uh, but in a lot of cases, they will dim up or dim down or increase or decrease in intensity to maintain a light level. That is a big thing to take away from with daylight harvesting. That is very much unlike ambient threshold. Ambient threshold, on the other hand, looks for a specified light level that is programmed and then turns the lights on or off. They will not fluctuate the intensity of the light level. Um, it'll either be on or it will be off. So in this particular example, the lights are on. When the sun comes to full brightness and it's shining through the windows, it will shut the light fixtures off. And then of course, when the sun sets, the light level will turn back on. So it's more of an on off operation than like with daylight harvesting where it's kind of generally increasing and decreasing as the um, sun comes maybe outside the clouds or go back under the clouds and so forth. Now, the reason why daylight harvesting is important is because it's a tremendous amount of energy savings. If you can take advantage of natural daylight in the space or other artificial light in the space, and if that area is creating enough light with the natural daylight or the artificial daylight, why not shut off the fixtures if you don't need them on? Another big reason is it uh, helps maintain and meet uh, local codes and energy codes. So for instance, if you look at ASHRAE 90.1 2019, specifically for parking garages, it is required that continuous daylight dimming down to 50% is required for luminaires within 20 feet of wall openings. It also goes on to say that for spaces with available light from natural light, continuous daylight dimming is required for all spaces. It just depends on what ASHRAE code you are part of and what your local codes are, but daylight harvesting kind of helps meet these um, different types of codes and requirements that now exist. Now, there are also something called occupancy sensors and also vacancy sensors. So let's talk about occupancy sensors first. Occupancy sensors automatically turn lights either to full on or partial on when motion is detected in the space, and then it reduces the light level after no motion is detected or it can shut the fixture off. So in this example, you have a light fixture, the person walks, the sensor senses motion, it turns on the fixture to 100% brightness. After a specific, specified period of time with no motion, it may dim down. In this example, I'm showing what 30% light output. And then it may actually even just shut off. It just depends on how you program the sensor. The next one is vacancy sensors. And vacancy sensors, on the other hand, um, it's kind of funny. They don't automatically turn on. You actually physically have to manually turn the lights on. So unlike the example, 
of occupancy sensors where somebody walks in, the lights turn on. Vacancy sensors means that you have to manually turn the lights on, uh, on, but they will shut off after there's no motion. So in this particular example, you have someone, they walk into the office, thing within the space, they leave after a period of time, the light fixtures will eventually dim down or shut off entirely. And again, in order for those lights to turn back on, they have to physically hit the button and then the lights will come back on. So that is how um, vacancy sensing works versus occupancy sensing. So why are occupancy sensors and vacancy sensors important? Same exact thing. Energy savings, number one, but to also meet the local codes for ASHRAE and even local codes that you may have in your own uh, area as well. And a lot of them, this 2019 NASH rate code actually specifically, it says that um, office spaces less than 250 square feet and restrooms shall be controlled by occupancy sensors. Also, conference rooms, meeting rooms, training rooms, storage rooms, break rooms also shall be controlled with auto on or manual on from an occupancy standpoint or vacancy standpoint. So just kind of keep that in mind as well. Now, many sensors have a hold time, a standby time, and you also have the ability to set the sensitivity. So first of all, let's talk about hold time and standby time. So in this first animation, you are going to see the fixtures off, but when motion is detected, it goes to 100%. Of course, that can be programmed to be less than 100% if you want to, uh, which I'll talk about here in a few minutes. Then after five minutes with no motion, that is what we refer to as the hold time. And then after that, you're going to notice that after five minutes of hold time and there's no motion, then the lights will go down to, in this example, 30% light output. And then after another 30 minutes, which we refer to as standby time, then the fixture will turn off entirely. So there's really three different situations. One, do you want the lights to go to 100% brightness when somebody walks in the space? How long do you want the hold time to be uh, after there's no motion? And what do you want those lights to do? Do you want them to uh, go down to 50% or 30% or whatever? And then there's another standby time, which is a whole another piece of the component or, or part of the, sen the sensor commissioning and uh, setting up the sensor properly. And that is the standby time. So those are three different things that are really important to understand. Also, as I mentioned, some sensors have the abilities to set sensitivity. And this is important because it aids in preventing false triggers. Now, as you watch this animation, you will see that the light fixture will turn on uh, depending upon the sensitivity, how the sensitivity is set for the sensor. So at 100%, the fixture will turn on fairly quickly. At 75%, the sensitivity, it takes a little bit longer. You got to get a little closer to the fixture. And at 50%, it takes even longer for the fixtures to turn, on, to turn on. You almost nearly need to be underneath the fixture for it to turn on. The reason that people like to be able to set the sensitivity is because it aids in preventing false triggers. Now, sensors also have something that uh, is now available with them, and that's the ability to set the maximum brightness, which we refer to also as high-end trim. This basically just sets the maximum brightness of the light source. Maybe the light source is producing too many lumens. You can reduce that by setting the brightness level to lower than 100%, you know, maybe 90% or 80% or 70%. And of course, if you do that, that's another really great way to also save energy because you're reducing the energy consumed. Now, there are four types of occupancy sensors. There's microwave, PIR, ultrasonic, and dual technology. Micro, uh, microwave basically just detects motion using microwaves by continuously sending out kind of like these radio frequencies and it looks for any frequency shifts. So it does not require line of sight. It's not like the matrix where you have lines of sight coming out, you know, red lines. It is actually just looking for a shift in the frequency. Microwave sensors are great because they have a quicker response time. It responds to any form of movement. Keep that in mind. It's great for environments where heat cycles are also irregular because it's not looking at any type of heat in the, in the space. Very much unlike PIR. PIR detects heat using infrared radiation, which can then detect motion through changes in temperature from the environment and moving things. This does require line of sight. So think of the matrix where you have red lines coming out of the sensor. If that red line is broken, then there's something going on and the sensor is going to react appropriately. Again, it requires line of sight. It picks up heat of objects, including humans and animals, 
It is really great for indoor commercial applications or outdoor applications near trees. Ultrasonic, on the other hand, it detects sound in the space by transmitting high frequency sound waves. It also does not require line of sight, very much like microwave sensors. It's usually used for more indoor applications, but you have to make sure that you put ultrasonic sensors away from AC units, away from fans, anything else that emits any sort of sound, because you can have major uh, false triggers if you do that. And then the last one, as you can imagine, is dual technology. And that is basically a combination of PIR and ultrasonic, and it detects both heat and sound. The reason that people like using dual technology is because it reduces false triggers. You basically have to have both sound and also heat in the space in order for it to um, to produce, you know, the 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 uh, the, or the sensor to actually be triggered. All right. So next up, uh, or one of the things I guess I should probably say is that um, a big thing. The reason I have actually just back up one second here. Microwave and PIR. The reason I have those two kind of uh, out outlined here is because microwave and PIR seem to be the most common these days. It used to be where dual technology was like a big thing for indoor applications. We're finding that PIR uh, is really doing a really nice job or microwave. You just have to make sure that you specify the right one based on the project. And the key that I can perhaps send you away with is that microwave sensors don't like to be things, don't like to be by things like trees or anything that has any type of movement, fans, ceiling fans, that kind of stuff. While PIR sensors are really great for outdoor applications where there may be moving trees, uh, but PIR is also really good for a number of other applications as well. So just as a little bit of a rule of thumb. Now, when it comes to sensors, something very important to consider is not only the technology, meaning do you need PIR, do you need microwave, but also the placement. This is probably almost one of the most important things outside the PIR and microwave. For this reason, all sensors have a detection pattern, which allows the coverage of the sensor uh, or it actually shows the coverage of the sensor based on the various sensitivity levels. If in fact you can set the sensitivity, you may actually find a sensor that does not give you the ability to set the sensitivity. In that case, it will still give you a detection pattern. It's usually always on every single spec sheet for any type of sensor. Also specifically for daylight harvesting sensors, these are usually used, of course, with uh, anywhere we have uh, windows that are facing the south or maybe skylights. And a general rule of thumb is that the daylight sensor should be placed one to two times the height of the window. So in this example here, it would be between four feet to eight feet from the window, window and then centered in the space. That's a really good rule of thumb because you wanna make sure you don't have that daylight sensor too close to the window. If you do, then um, you're, you're not gonna get that natural daylight coming in. You've gotta make sure you get that back far enough to have that natural daylight coming in and have it be able to pick it up. All right, so next we are gonna talk a little bit more about mounting. And um, first of all, you can probably imagine there's a lot of different ways that sensors can be incorporated into projects. So one, they can be embedded into a switch, they can be mounted to the ceiling, or they can even plug into, uh, or they can be mounted to a wall, like a cold corner. You probably have seen those before. They can also plug into a lamp using a 3.5 millimeter plug. Uh, that's kind of a new way of adding controls or sensors specifically to a, um, a lamp. They can also twist lock into a receptacle kind of like what you see here in this video that's playing. They can also screw into a screw in port found on fixtures. And they can also snap in also to fixtures. And then the rest of these is basically they can twist lock into the NEMA receptacle. They can even screw onto an end of a fixture via a half inch knockout. Uh, sensors can even be embedded into fixtures like this wall pack showing here featuring a dust to dawn sensor. And there are some that plug into outlets. There's even some sensors that screw into a fixture socket. So lots of different ways to incorporate sensors into your project. There's no doubt about it. Now, the benefits of using sensors are, of course, reduce energy consumption. They aid in improving safety and security, and they certainly help meet energy codes and other building codes as well. So in summary, when incorporating sensors into a project, it's really important to consider what type of sensor do you need, a photo sensor, an occupancy sensor, or a vacancy sensor. If you are using a vacancy sensor, keep in mind, you've got to have a switch that goes with it, because remember, you have to be able to manually turn those on. 
Also, are there south facing rooms that could utilize daylight harvesting? Then you probably want to consider a daylight harvesting sensor. Does the application require a microwave, a PIR, a ultrasonic, or dual technology? Also, be sure to consider the detection pattern and the placement of the sensor. And then the last thing, and perhaps one of the most important things as well, is don't forget about commissioning the sensor. Commissioning is a process that ensures the sensors will perform according to how it was planned. This is when you set things like uh, time delay, standby time, sensitivity. And it's very interesting, but there was a little study that was done by Lawrence National Laboratory that says successful commissioning can achieve 13% energy savings in new construction and 16% in existing buildings. So you need to make sure you take the time to do the commissioning. If you don't, you are going to not get the full advantage of incorporating a sensor into the project. Of course, with standalone controls, most of the commissioning is done on the unit itself, uh, but with network sensors, the commissioning is actually done via an app of some sort. And uh, you'll find as we get into network lighting controls that incorporating network sensors into projects is very, very, very simple compared to standalone controls. I hope you enjoyed this uh, session section of the lighting controls basics. Um, and if you have any questions, you can contact me at lynette.schafer at ico.com.